Good day and hello everybody. This is Monday, February the 7th and as our country is slowly falling apart at the seams, some of us are just trying to hold it together. I went and got you a little bit more Jordan Peterson. He was in uh, somebody else's podcast and I just thought I would give you the first 30 minutes of that just so you could hear some insights from his mind as he's being asked the questions in this particular case. And thank you for watching the uh, one I put out over the weekend. Anyway, guys, listen, I'm not going to keep you like share subscribe all that stuff i hate asking it's tacky but you help me out and helps get this uh out there you're watching epgn news media your independent source for news and global coverage so i'd like to start there Let, let's welcome thank you for joining us let's talk about heroism for a minute um, because the truckers in ottawa and those supporting them have been called heroes by people supporting them and, and sort of on the anti-mandate side, but they've also been called things like terrorists on the other side. Which is it, do you think? Well, I guess we're going to find out as the weeks progress because it's a constant choice, you know, and it seems to me that the truckers and the protesters that accompany them by and large have been making the right choices. The demonstrations have remained peaceful they're not taking the bait and we'll see what happens this weekend because they're going to be under they're going to be increasingly provoked as the political situation becomes increasingly unmanageable for all for the people who are insisting that the mandates stay in place with no good reason as far as i can tell uh, the data seem to be fairly convincing and i think have been actually for several months that omicron is a rather serious flu and no more than that and the Johns Hopkins study that was released the other day seems to indicate, indicate quite clearly that lockdowns didn't have the desired effect on mortality. Now people are criticizing the study and saying, well, that wasn't the only positive effect. It's like, yeah, but you suspended our fundamental civil liberties. So let's go to the hard data, shall we? Mm -hmm. And we certainly haven't paid the price for the lockdowns yet, not by any stretch of the imagination. Mm -hmm. So we'll see. I'm, I hope the truckers keep their head and 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 maintain peace and civility in the most cautious of manners because it is a tinderbox and in when you're all sitting inside a tinderbox it only takes one idiot to light a match so you know the word hero comes from the greek for defender or protector and that is sort of the opposite of a terrorist isn't it uh so it'll be very interesting to see uh how this goes in no, I can't get out of my mind. It's this idea has really gotten a grip on me the last few days that this trucker convoy um, is the single most powerful resistance, we might call it, that the Canadian people will be capable of to challenge these mandates. Um, yeah, and it's a grassroots thing, which is so interesting watching the NDP react to this. It's so stunning to me that Elon Musk tweets out in favor of the truckers and Yagmeet Singh, who's an actor unparalleled in his falseness, perhaps only by Trudeau, mm -hmm. has so clearly indicated how little he wants to do with the working class. Mm -hmm. It's something remarkable to behold. And I mean, the truckers are making an articulate protest in some sense, right? They're there with their trucks. That's their protest. They're they're standing their ground and they've had enough of the assault on our fundamental freedoms essentially and it's up to leaders like trudeau and singh and the conservatives to articulate those voices and to bring them forward peacefully and to attend to them instead of demonizing them and and then doing these unbelievably appalling maneuvers first of all focusing on the confederate flag the, and the mainstream media is absolutely complicit in this it's like that is so preposterous that it barely it's so surreal it's hard to believe it's even true as if the confederate flag has anything to do with canadian history as if it ever has as if there's people rallying behind that in some important sense and the same thing can be said about the single swastika flag which is one too many obviously and the idea that the Terry Fox statue was desecrated. 
compared to say what happened to the John A. McDonald statue. And people should have kept their statue. yeah, absolutely. People should have kept their mitts off the Terry Fox statue, obviously. But I understand the truckers have put guard around it now, and the what the legacy media is doing with the trucker protest is beyond reprehensible. I think the most dangerous thing I've seen actually is the political attempts to shut down the GoFundMe funding. That's that's unparalleled. I think that's an unparalleled act in Canadian history. I truly think that's the worst thing that's happened to us so far. You the government has, by that? You know, I'm constantly surprised. I, I'm, not, I'm not by nature a cynic, you know, really. And I'm not cynical about our public institutions. And generally, although not invariably, I'm not cynical about politicians. But the, the act of sheer short-sighted, narcissistic, self-righteous idiocy that went into blocking the GoFundMe funding is, I just can't believe that, I cannot believe that our political leadership can be that unconcerned even about their own well-being. What sort of precedent does this set? And, and to, it's basically a form of theft, collusion between a fairly large corporate entity, GoFundMe, and the government. It's like collusion between the government and the press, which is almost total now in Canada. Mm -hmm. And I don't say that lightly. I mean, Brian Peckford, who I interviewed on my YouTube channel about a week and a half ago, who was a mainstream, is a mainstream political figure and one of the drafters of the Canadian Charter of Rights, like a respectable guy and was never a, a radical relatively well regarded by the left and the right alike in the 1980s, a solid guy told me flat out that the reason that he announced his legal challenge to the authority of our government on my YouTube channel was because he didn't think that he could get the truth told about what he was doing by any reliable Canadian news outlet. Mm -hmm. And that's, and that's just what do you what do you do when someone like that says something like that to you it's beyond comprehension well i was going to ask you what do you do when you feel that um our main media outlets are not accurately reporting the situation it's interesting because our experiences are very different you haven't been in ottawa or in canada since this started right so you have a perspective only that's coming through various kinds of, of media and other sorts of information sources i was there sunday through tuesday um, and I have to say that being there, and I can say I had my young daughter with me uh, out walking on the streets, talking with truckers, and um, I didn't feel afraid one moment. Um, I didn't see most of the image. Now, I'm not, you know, I wasn't every place at every moment, of course, um, but I did not, what I'm seeing reported, uh, you know, in CTV and Global and uh, CBC, it's like a parallel realities. It's a planned, no worse than that, it's a planned parallel reality, which is fundamentally equivalent to a totalitarian encroachment. I mean, CBC should be shut down. Canadians should just say enough. There's, there's, there's absolutely no excuse whatsoever for another single dollar of Canadian taxpayer money to go to support that appallingly corrupt, ideologically uh, warped, politically correct, collusionary media source with the federal government it's inexcusable and the rest of the media well it's part of their pronounced death spiral you see a little exception to that uh the toronto sun has had some decent reporting you see it pop up now and then in the national post you see it pop up now and then even in the globe and mail but by and large it's almost impossible to see what's actually going on in ottawa you can't even get a reasonable estimate of the number of people there and i've also mm -hmm. heard let's say that this closed circuit cameras that normally monitor the city, which I believe you can get access to by public feed, many of them have been shut off. Hmm. It's like, you know, now, is that true? Is it not true? I don't know if it's true. It wouldn't surprise me, but it's also, if it is true, it's also, well, it's beyond, it's beyond my capacity to imagine that we're in this situation. 
Isn't yeah. it all feeling just a bit dystopian to you or a lot dystopian that, you know, Friday, the police were talking about doing digital tracking and now protesting isn't allowed. And the prime minister just is describing the supporters as championing uh, abuse and racism and um, money is we were talking about GoFundMe. Money is being taken. And sexism and Islamophobia, and, every bloody course, playbook in the radical things. left in the in the radical left lexicon. It's like. Yeah. You dare to drive your trucks to Ottawa to oppose our possibly illegal mandates, probably illegal mandates. What's wrong with you? You must be all of these terrible things. And and then let's get the press in on it, too. And then, you know, I would hope that the conservatives, for their part, would stand up in some sort of opposition. But I know full well, because I've talked to people who know um, that COVID policy has been governed entirely by public opinion poll which is a terrible way of sampling public opinion because it's impulsive and narrow, which is why we have a parliamentary system to begin with. We don't have rule by direct democracy because it's foolish. It doesn't allow for any sober second thought, let's say. And so the, the politicians scare the public and they do that with the collusion of psychologists and behavioral experts, scare them into compliance. And so then they're all scared and then they sample public opinion, which is terrified by misinformation and say, oh, look, people support more mandates and that scares them further and away we go. And the conservatives, for their part, instead of, although Mo and Kenny have taken some more forthright actions in the last week, instead mm -hmm. of seizing the moment, which they clearly had in front of them, they just blew their party into fragments, like on the very day they should have been articulating the concerns of the people that they are supposed to represent and and they could have capitalized on that even in the narrow political sense it's just beyond comprehension let's, let's talk about democracy for a minute we know that the prime minister's office has made it very clear that, that it uh, the prime minister will not speak with the truckers and up to this point o'toole also decided not to speak with the truckers now we have new leadership in the conservative party um what kind of act of democracy is that, do you think? And is there an obligation on the part of our leaders to respond to protests? Well, it's a tough one, right? Because it's very hard to discriminate between protest and extortion in some sense, right? And we can't have a situation where merely by creating a civil disturbance, you get access to the highest levels of leadership. Right. But by the same token, I would say that the fact of the scale of this protest and its seriousness is an indication of a breakdown in communication between the populace and their leaders. And then I would say there's a twofold reason for that. One is the politicians have ensconced themselves in something resembling an ivory tower and are not in direct contact with their constituents in the way that they're morally obligated to be in contact. And then there's a failure on the part of the Canadian populace as well, because one of the things that's happened over the last three, four, five decades, maybe, is a continuing in civic engagement on the part of the populace. This cynicism about the political sphere, the refusal to engage in the building of local civic institutions, all replaced by a notion that politics is somehow nothing but a snake pit and no decent person would ever get involved. And so you have an abdication of responsibility on the part of each Canadian, I would say, which clearly needs to be rectified. And then this isolation of the political class from the population that, that's, that's replaced by a reliance on hypothetical experts in the medical and the political domain and sampling of, of the public attitude by opinion poll. This is not a recipe for a stable polity as, as we can see. So. You mentioned before we started recording, we were just chatting that we are going to be dealing with this kind of situation for a long time. Uh, what, what are the implications if we lose this fight? Well, I don't know what it would mean to lose it. I mean, I, I can't see how the mandates can go on forever. Mm -hmm. Country after country is dropping them. I cannot see how they can be sustained in the face of that for any length of time, but God only knows. I mean, it, it seems to me that perhaps even a majority of Canadians, if they were sufficiently cowed, would accept these restrictions and mask mandates permanently. It's already been two years mm -hmm. and a huge, there's a huge public outcry, although it's hard to tell 
what the proportions are against the truckers and in favor of what? Continued mandates? Well, they're afraid. I remember there was a poll a few months ago showing that 50% of Democrats in the US thought there was a 50% chance of being hospitalized with COVID. And 25% and of Republicans believe the same thing. And I'm sure the proportions are very similar in Canada. People are afraid and the politicians should be coming out and saying, we got this. Like, there's always things to be afraid of, but that isn't what's happened. Um, if the, if I, I really have no idea how, the, how this is going to go. I think what will happen is that a few provinces will carefully test the public opinion waters, which seems to be happening, say, in Saskatchewan and Alberta, and say, well, here's a way out in a month. How's that settling? And if that works out, they'll say, well, maybe we'll try it in two weeks, something like that. And if that happens, maybe there's a pathway forward. But our prime minister could easily double down because he has the he's an he's a teenager. He's a he's a teenage actor, fundamentally. The fact that he ran away at the beginning of this and then lied about why in two ways, security concerns and exposure to COVID, it's like a little convenient, I would say. And really, did you need two lies to justify it? Wasn't one enough? Apparently not. And the fact that he ran away at all is just also jaw-droppingly jaw -droppingly stunning to me. It's like, does Why he believe? that matter to so many people i mean i think it's starting to matter to more and more but why don't people look at that look at that fear and cowardice and call it out for what it is and then why are they not afraid of not having a leader i think it's easier for them to believe that the truckers are dangerous like confederate rebel dangerous whatever the hell that means in canada nazi dangerous this whole nazi thing is just beyond comprehension it's Canada doesn't have a radical right wing. Well, I think it's easier for people to believe that the truckers are January 6th level insurrectionists than it is for them to believe that they have a leader who is that immature and cowardly. Because we think about, I mean, both of those are, those are both nasty pills to swallow. But if you're a, a a middle of the road Canadian, and you've had an implicit belief in the stability of your political institutions, which is reasonable because they've been incre incredibly stable. You believe in the general goodness of your leaders, which has also been a valid presumption. And now you're forced to swallow this pill, which is no, things are so bad that your leader, who's a teenage uh, actor, literally ran away in the face of some political opposition, or these people can't be trusted. Well, Obviously, it's much easier to believe that the truckers can't be trusted. And then that's played up, of course, in the media. It's like, well, what about the swastikas? And what about the Confederate flag? And, and people also still trust CTV. They still trust CBC, especially older people. And it's no wonder they do, because once you could, and they, they're not up on the technological revolution, and no bloody wonder, because who is? And it, so people are being asked to abandon faith in some sense in political establishments and political leadership or demonize the truckers. Well, it's not surprising they, they, they pick the latter. Do you think people like living in fear in some sense? I mean, I guess in a way that sounds crazy. Why would anyone want to live a fearful life? But as you have said, for two years, we have voluntarily pretty easily agreed to all of these mandates in the absence of really any kind of solid evidence to support them. I mean, now we have a situation, the practical upshot of all of this is you can be a symptomatic COVID positive person dining in a restaurant while an uninfected unvaccinated person is waiting outside to pick up their takeout order right and yet it seems like many most i don't know where we're at in terms of the numbers feel like well that's all right that's I, I don't i don't think people like living in fear but they like to believe that they're on the side of compassion and security when uncertainty and threat looms and so that's the moral and it's it's an easy moral victory it's it, remember I used to watch The Simpsons all the time, and the wife of the reverend on the on The Simpsons, her response to any political question was, "Think about the children. Let's think about the children." And that's, and our whole society has slipped has slipped into that kind of Oedipal virtue, which is 
It's a reflexive infantile compassion. And there's a presumption underneath that, that it, the manifestation of that compassion, which is appropriate for infants, is the only valid political response to every single question. And so you, you frighten people and the good thinkers, the maternal good thinkers think, oh, well, security and safety, protect the infants. And fair enough, because you've got to protect the infants, but we're not infants, or are we? And so our, and our whole political discourse is is warped be by that strategy with safety right we have this pure yeah. culture this safe do you think that's historically unprecedented are we more obsessed with yes definitely why, why? Well, why is that why because of the large-scale movement of women into the political sphere hmm. that's a huge part of it is women are more agreeable than men and so compassion for them is a what is an easier moral uh it's it's the easiest moral option that's available and this is a real it's a real struggle right because how much you should push forward bravely and how much you should secure the home front that's a constant question but we have a we've had a mass movement of women into institutional and political arena and so that's one element of it that we haven't contended with at all and no one will even ask the question and then there's another issue that's that's relevant to this too is that um, the female mode of antisocial behavior is reputation destruction. Like males engage in physical conflict, but that isn't how, especially antisocial males, they'll use physical dominance as a, well, as a mean to obtain their narrow self-interested goals. That's a bully and bullies become criminals. That's not the female antisocial pathway. The female antisocial pathway is gossip, maliciousness, and reputation savaging. And and that there's a very well documented psychiatric literature looking at antisocial behavior in women. I'm, I'm not making this up out of whole cloth. The problem with that is it scales on social media. So male aggression doesn't proximity. In some sense, our COVID response is a gendered issue. Yes, yes. Well, you can see that in the attitudes of the only Canadians right now who support mandates full out are women over 55. And I think, yeah, well, no wonder that's what a grandmother should do, you know. This but is so as interesting, a, though, because what you're suggesting, I think, and correct me if I'm wrong, is that things like compassion and empathy, which seem morally good or morally neutral, maybe morally good, uh, are sliding into the safety obsession, which have really become a kind of myopia, mm -hmm. right? Because it's made us focus exclusively not just on harm avoidance, mm -hmm. but on a certain kind of harm avoidance in a certain sphere. And that has generated these mandates that have the appearance of protection which can't help but sound good yeah right? that's How right that that's right bad? that well absolutely well and and who could you possibly be to oppose that you know evil. what makes you so sure you're not a predator well, i mean you and i have both been called evil so yes yes <laughs> well well and that is part of that 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 security feminine security response now i'm not blaming women for this this is a very complicated problem mm -hmm. but the that which threatens the integrity of an infant is a predator now the question is what what happens when that scales now the psychoanalyst said this is a freudian idea the good mother necessarily fails and that's that's exemplified by michelangelo's pieta that's like a symbol of the female crucifixion it's to offer your children to be broken to the by the world and that's a major sacrifice on the part of women. It's a major, yeah, right, absolutely, absolutely. And that's female heroism. It just gives me chills because yeah, well, no being kidding. a mother, it's like it does evoke those kind of those feelings of the very unnatural to think that you would yeah. do that. that you yeah, do. well, but but the alternative is to devour them, right? That's that's the Freudian nightmare. It's like you don't if you don't propel your children out to the world so you're the supporter of the call to adventure which is terrifying it's terrifying my 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 daughter-in-law she uh she was with her son uh, elliot for 18 months and then she went back to work and she made arrangements with a woman who had a couple of little kids in daycare and she brought elliot to daycare and let him off and he was ready for it They'd prepared him for it, but he cried when she left and she just left. 
And that's, she could have hovered on the boundary there and tortured him to death for like three hours, right? Because of her misery in abandoning her child, in some sense, uh, in, uh, the misery of losing her infant, because that's what that marked. And then she went home and cried. It's like, good for her. She went home and cried. That was the right thing to do, not to demonstrate her inability to let go of that maternal attachment when it was appropriate, which is really an act of transcendent heroism on the part of a mother. And that's not, that's not that reflexive compassion that all too often is confused with moral virtue in our culture. The fact that you feel sorry for people does not mean that you're good. Now, it might be one element of what could make you good if you were good, but that reflex, reflex isn't hey, let, good. Let's, let's say that again. The fact that you feel sorry for people does not mean you're good, is not a sign that you're good. So feeling mm -hmm. sorry for people, we might think that that's empathy. Hmm. Well, it is, in the, it is in, the, in the most primordial sense. It's mm -hmm. what makes you go, ah, when you see a kitten, you know, and, and fair enough, but <laughs> going, ah, when you see a kitten on a plate, that's neither a sign of your aesthetic sophistication nor your moral virtue. Mm -hmm. And so because moral, moral virtue is a multifaceted phenomenon, and this is also in some sense what the politicians have forgotten, is like, follow the science. Well, what data? And selected by who? And which scientists? <laughs> and, yeah, good luck. No kidding. Good luck. It's such a lie. It's a philosophically shallow lie. Too, but it sounds great. And we've been conditioned to believe that that's where truth and goodness reside. Science has become a synonym for, for moral purity and perfection. Yeah. I think. Well, it's also the case that it, it allows the politicians to abdicate responsibility in the face of a crisis. It's like, well, we're deferring to the experts. It's like, no, no. There's no deferring to the experts if you're a politician. There's consultation with a diverse range of experts. That's that's a whole different thing. Yeah. It's like, well, we're we're deferring to the physicians. What about the economists? You forgot about them? What about and that's your What about the physicians who disagree well, with each sample. other? Well, or the yes, economists who disagree do. with each other. Yeah, well, and the economists always disagree with the biologists too, because the biologists are always generally blunt, you know, vaguely speaking. Most of the Malthusian environmentalist types are biologically minded. You know, oh my God, the sky is falling. Well, the economists say, no, we can we can innovate our way around this like we have in the past. Mm -hmm. And we don't have any obvious limit to resources. And there's a real argument to be had there. What are the limits to economic growth and prosperity? Are there any? Where are they located? Well, this is a real argument, but the idea that you can defer to the biological catastrophists is an abdication of political responsibility. And self-destructive, most likely. Well, well, you everybody can watch for themselves. Just watch what happens to energy prices in, the, in Europe. Just watch. And just watch what happens to poor people, because it's coming, and fast. I think one in 10 people in the UK have already received at least one disconnection notice from their utilities. One in 10. So, you know, and in Canada, the same reflexively compassionate popinjays are going to war on the, so in the fundamental years, basis of the Western economy, you know, the, the oil and years, gas industry. Are we going to see greater disparity between the upper and lower classes, higher levels of homelessness, higher levels? We're of certainly going to see greater, all the, all the COVID policy has driven immense amounts of capital to a small proportion of people. I mean, everyone knows this. How many houses were had so much cardboard they could hardly even figure out where to store it because of Amazon purchases? Now, Amazon sells everything. And, you know, in some sense, hats off to Jeff Bezos, because look at the supply chain that he managed to keep going under dire conditions during the pandemic. But on the other hand, every cent he made, in some sense, was taken from small business people. And we've decimated the small business community. And to think of that as somehow less dangerous than the pandemic is utterly foolish. I, I, think, I think the move that was made this week to scuttle the GoFundMe funding for the truckers is more dangerous to our collective health than the pandemic. Just that one move. 